The Booster Pack Throwback Podcast is part of the Booster Pack Network. For more TCG-related content, visit theboosterpacknetwork.com. Hosting for this show is sponsored by Category 1 Games, the go-to shop for all of your classic TCG needs. Find your favorites or discover something new at Category1Games.com. Hello and welcome to the Booster Pack Throwback. My name is Rands, and this is the show where we unwrap the stories and crack the mysteries of trading card game history each and every episode. Now, if you're joining us for the very first time, welcome. But if you've joined us before, you're going to notice something a little bit different. That's right, this show used to be called the Booster Pack. And just with this episode, we've changed it to the Booster Pack Throwback now. And it is now found not on CCG History's feed, but on the Booster Pack Network feed, where you're going to see over the coming months and into next year, new content and new creators on the channel as well. We're going to keep all the stuff that you've learned to love so far, but there's also more stuff coming down the line. More on that elsewhere on the channel. Now, as I said, this is the show on the network that actually focuses on gaming history. And if you've come for gaming history, you could probably not do much better because we have a guest today who has created possibly more history than anybody else over the last three decades when it comes to tabletop gaming. And they continue to create history to this very day. Now, our guest is such a luminary that they probably don't even need it introduction and many of you that will be familiar with them but i'm going to give them one anyway i can't even help myself yes over the last 20 years our guest has been the owner of north america's largest gaming convention gen con that's right from there they are also the director and executive producer of the fantasy web series world of chaldea now both of those roles are very bright and exciting and we could probably spend our entire time today just talking about them but being a history show we're going to dive back even further than that because in the year 1990 our guests got their start in the industry by founding a small independent role-playing game publishing company called wizards of the coast yes as you probably well know wizards of the coast went on to metamorphosize tabletop gaming with the advent of the collectible trading card game genre by launching Magic the Gathering in 1993. From there, our guest and their colleagues went on to innovate in the TCG space by creating a number of other games based on major brands in the tabletop gaming sphere. They include Battletech, Netrunner, and of course, Vampire the Eternal Struggle. However, it was the next big hit that they landed with an import from Japan that featured colorful monsters what else would it be? Of course, Pokemon. So as the person responsible for the success of Magic the Gathering and bringing Pokemon over to the West, it's hard to imagine that our guest has had a bigger impact on hobby gaming. But that's not where it ends because they also rescued one of the most iconic gaming titles of all time from the brink of extinction. That is, of course, Dungeons and & Dragons, and that was the game that inspired our guests to get into gaming in the first place. It's such a beautiful story, but I don't want to spoil too much of it because we're not going to have much time to talk about it in this episode, but I'm going to let the guests talk about a couple of little things themselves in just a second. Allow me to introduce them. So I am delighted to welcome to the Booster Pack somebody who's not only here celebrating the 30th episode of this show, but also somebody who is helping us celebrate the fact that we're now entering the 30th year since the invention of the collectible trading card game genre. Welcome to the show. It is the very first wizard, and by all accounts I've heard, the most humble human being in the history of hobby games, Peter Atkinson. Peter, how do you do, bud? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on your program. Uh, that's a That was a great overview of, of my, my credits. It is uh, humbling. Well, indeed, that sounds appropriate for you. And like I was saying before we turn the mics on, you don't make a show like this without wanting to talk to somebody like yourself who's responsible for so much history. Um, so let's dive in, though, with your own history before we jump into the gaming and business side of things. Tell me about, like, I mentioned it sort of there. Tell me about how you first fell in love with gaming. Well, you know, I was raised in a family of gamers, not, you know, not our type of games, you know, uh, board games and cart, but role playing games, but, you know, a family that had the culture of like, this is something you do as a family, you get together and you play games. It was like card games, mostly and, and simple board games, you know, like Monopoly and so on. So I, I, I think the pump was primed in a certain respect. And, um, uh, so my dad and I started playing more serious games in the mid-70s uh, after some of his students brought over Risk, 
Uh, so you know, be the first block on, be the first kid on your block to control the world. You know, that was that's an exciting premise. What a tagline! Yeah, we immediately loved Risk, and uh, that led to me having an eye for that type of game and going to a game store and spotting the old board war games by Avalon Hill. Awesome. Well, um, uh, then eventually something really revolutionary happens to gaming, uh, you know, uh, during that generation, which we sort of led into there. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Tell me all about how you first experienced this fantasy side of hobby role playing. It's funny because I, for a long time, I kind of thought of myself as a latecomer to Dungeons and Dragons because I, I didn't hear about it when it first came out. Uh, I didn't pick it up until 1978. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, I was at a, a game store and my brother had just recently introduced me to The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, uh, which I read all four books in a weekend. I just devoured him. And I was like, wow, this fantasy stuff is cool. Like, so, you know, again, the pump was primed. I'm in a war in, in a uh, a game store and I'm looking and you know, I've got a war game in my hands and I look on the counter and I see this blue box set with a dragon on it you know and, and like I had no idea what the hell it was you know but it had a it had a dragon and so I bought it and of course it was the uh it was uh, original Dungeons and Dragons before AD&D and it was you know the box set it was you know how I learned how to play D and D. Well, tell me then, uh, where does Wizards of the Coast fit into all this? Because eventually, you know, you're playing games, you're crafting your own homebrew worlds. Where does, uh, you know, the idea of becoming a game publisher come from? From how does that stem through it? The first, uh, in the first seed was planted while my friend, you know, of course, as a gamer, I have other gamers that I'm hanging out with and playing friends, and and several of us uh, back in college. So this is like circa 1984, maybe. And we had just bought a D and D expansion uh, from the Judges Guild called the uh, the uh, City State of the Invincible War Overlord, and we were looking through it. It was ooing and aahing. How cool it was! Wow, this is great. And one of my friends said, "You know, we could make something like this." You know, <laughs> and another one of my friends says, "Yeah, we could start a game company. We could call it Wizards of the Coast." And I mean, that was the extent. I mean, like immediately, that was the name we were going to use because it was the name of a Wizards Guild in another campaign that we all played in, and we were terrified of the Wizards of the Coast. Like they show up on a battle, and like all of a sudden, it was like escalation. You know, like somebody pulling out nuclear weapons. <laughs> and so we we sat there and daydreamed about starting a game company, and then we thought, you know, maybe we should finish college first. <laughs> so, so, so I mean. That was like this isolated conversation and it never, it didn't come up again until years later, you know? So this is a 19, I don't even know exactly when it is. I think 1983, maybe. So in 1990, um, I was with one of the guys that was there, Kim McLaughlin, and I, I talked to him and said, hey, we should start Wizards of the Coast, for real. We should do it, you know? And of course it was to make role-playing games. We had, not, you know, Richard had not yet invented uh, Magic the Gathering. I didn't even know Richard at that moment. It was just me and my RPG buddies saying, hey, let's start an RPG company called Wizards of the Coast. And so we did. And then all of a sudden, you guys obviously start pouring the creativity of crafting those worlds into, you know, these new products you guys are releasing. Yeah, yeah. So we start, uh, you know, so all of our creativity is is going into uh, RPGs. And, you know, that's our our first love. And, um, you know, the idea of doing something other than an RPG didn't really enter our minds. Uh, but fortunately, because, you know, RPGs are not the greatest business in the world. Um, <laughs> fortunately, along the way, um, I met Richard Garfield. I, I think I was starting to realize that RPGs were not a very lucrative segment of tabletop games, especially in 19, you know, 91, 92, whenever this was. And so I think I was already kind of thinking about what else could I be doing? You know, what, what else should we be doing? So I was, I kind of had my feelers out and I met a guy named Mike Davis, who was Richard Garfield's friend, um, who wasn't a game designer, but was out pimping Richard's games. Cause Richard was like, uh, he was still in grad school to, in his life goal was to be a math professor you know an academic and if you ever met him you would see yeah yeah he would be a great academic 
Uh, so when Mike was telling him, well, you should get your, you have all these games. He had something like 70 games that he designed that were in his closet, you know, and Mike was like, man, you should get one of your, you know, we should do this. And, and there was one in particular called Robo Rally, which, um, the, the, the Mike really, they both really liked this game. And so Richard said, well, I don't want to deal with going out and submitting and all that sort of stuff like that. So he said, told Mike, if you can, you go out and see if you can get this game published and you can get half half of whatever we make from it so mike mike uh so mike reached out to me he saw me uh back in those days the internet forums were this thing called usenet which i think are still around uh it definitely archived at least yeah I, th I think it's actually still a thing but just only on the geekiest of the geek and back then it was all we didn't have social media that was where you exchanged messaging with people in uh early 90s so I think it was on rec.games.board.design was the name of the group, I believe. And Mike saw some post I saw, I, I some post I made about um, games. And he reached out to me and said, hey, I got this game called Robo Rally. Do you, would you be interested in, in looking at it? And I said, sure. And uh, so that's, that's how we met. And uh, that eventually led to us uh, getting together and him designing magic. Well, that's uh, so Robo Rally, for those who might not know, is more of a traditional board game, something a little bit more, um, you know, weighty, you know, like a big box and, you know, a board and all these little pieces and stuff like that. So that's quite a margin of difference from going from a book, essentially a book publisher, you know, game books, but still game books to this big leap. So uh, it would be interesting for you guys to tackle that uh, that problem. Well, and in fact, we didn't. Not at that moment. Uh, so when I first saw the game, uh, I looked at it and I, I arranged to meet with them. Uh, he was on the East Coast, but his parents lived in Portland and I live in Seattle, which is a fairly close. Um, so I I went down and met him in, in Portland, him and Mike both, Richard and Mike. And I said, well, I don't think I can do a board game, guys. Uh, first of all, the board gaming market then was small too, unless you were big box retail games like monopoly you know games you know we had a few great games that came out in the 70s and the 80s and uh you know like titan and dune and uh, cosmic encounters um but it wasn't big business and i i was just barely figuring out role-playing games at the time we met we hadn't actually published our first role-playing book so everything was new and complicated for us and so we're like well a role-playing game's Easy to understand. It's like you said, it's just a book, right? A uh, board game, it's got a box, it's got a board, it's got all these pieces, and and it has a book. <laughs> so you're already you're already in for the one major thing. Then you've got to add all plastic pieces and stuff as well. I know. So I just said, you know, this thing looks intimidating, and I'm not I I just not sure I could do something like this. It looks like it's capital intensive. And we were poor, we didn't have any money, you know. So I I just threw out I I and so Richard said. And this sounds arrogant, but he is not an arrogant guy. He's a sweetheart of a guy. But he said, well, Peter, I just love designing games. You tell me what you want me to design. I'll design any game you want. Well, he probably thought that one of those 70 might have fit the bill, right? Yeah, right. So uh, I said, well, how about a card game? You know, I um, I had noticed I go to some of these small little conventions. Um, I shouldn't say small. Little, some, of, some are decent sized conventions, too, where there was a lot of fantasy and science fiction art on display from artists who who weren't getting their art published because there weren't a lot of venues for publishing fantasy art in, in those days, right? There's like once in a while a, a novel or maybe a TSR hardback, but for the most part, just really hard to find um, ways to get your stuff published. And so I just kind of had this theory. I thought, you know, I think if we did a card game, I think I could get quite a bit of fantasy or science fiction art at a decent price because there's a lot of people who just want to get published, right? And um, so I, I said, you know, I just, I think I can make the leap to just figure out how to make card because it's all like, make, you know, it's, it's paper. It's got to be like making books, right? I, I was wrong. Chopped up books, yeah. Yeah, I said, I don't want any other components. I don't want just cards. So that suggestion there is sort of the impetus of the entire collectible card game sort of genre. That's the that's the, that's the the conception, if you will, of, uh, of, of the whole idea eventually yeah that was the 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 point where things started and i always want to jump in when i tell this story and explain you know, i'm not i did not have the big idea you know the idea of making these trading cards you know and and you know building your own decks and all that stuff like that richard deserves uh the sole credit for all of that 
Um, I just happen to be lucky enough to say, hey, how about a card game? Because I think I can get cheap art. <laughs> You know, and, and from that conversation, though, Richard had already been playtesting and designing a game he called The Five Magics, um, which was not a collectible or, or trading card or game in any sense, just a regular card game with five colors of magic. So he had all this kind of in his back pocket already. And, um, uh, and you know, and I, I suppose maybe my conversation was stimulating for him, like it got him thinking. And uh, he describes it as, you know, walking out in nature. I think of Noma Falls. And all of a sudden, you know, this idea came to him, you know, um, of a collectible, you know, trading card game with cards, you know, the, the whole, where you build your deck and, you you know, and play against another player and they have their own deck. And the cards are, the rules for the card are on the card and all this stuff that, that we now take for granted as endemic to this type of game. It all just kind of came to him in in the flash of inspiration and a literal eureka moment for him, I guess, as a designer. Yeah, it was a. Um, I mean, I think creativity works that way. Um, you know, you'd you'd like to think that if I just press my brain, I could get there. Right. Well, and at the same time, the zeitgeist sort of had. I guess baseball cards were big, and sort of you know fantasy, sort of non sports cards were sort of in the ether as well. So you know, I'm sure those ideas were kicking around as well. Oh, right, for sure. I I think the zeitgeist has a lot to do with it. I you know um, Dungeons and Dragons the same way. Uh, you know, John Peterson lays out in his book how about the zeitgeist. His whole book is about the zeitgeist around all the different con confluencing factors that caused Dungeons and Dragons to be thought of, or, you know, that, that it was even possible to think of this game. And I think that was happening with magic. Like you said, sports trading cards. Um, uh, Richard likes to credit Cosmic Encounter, uh, the board game, as an influence because it's a game that's very asynchronous, all the different players have different abilities and their abilities that break the game or you know, break the rules and stuff like this. And, and, you know, he credits Dungeons and Dragons a lot for, uh, you know, the fantasy inspiration for magic, stuff like that. So, yeah. So he called me up like three days later and said, Peter, I need to come and talk. I'm, I'm going to come to Seattle next weekend if you're available. And I, I, I have this idea I got to tell you about. And so. And then that was it. So tell me about that. So he presents you with this idea that is, you know this this uh, eureka moment you know like it's almost come from nature itself or something like that as as you were describing it before tell me about like what was your first impression of of this sort of you know randomized card thing that just didn't exist you have a brand new sort of concept in front of you how does how does that feel to be presented with it uh well it was incredible uh <laughs> you know i am um, i'm thankful that i was immediately captivated by this idea and it reminded me of the first time back with Dungeons and Dragons, not the moment I bought the game or even looked at it, but the first time, which was actually months later, <laughs> that I when I finally understood the game, which did not happen right away. Because you know the rules were not it wasn't presented very well. Common complaint for early Dungeons and Dragons for sure. So, but when I got it, my mind was just blown. Like, oh my God, this is amazing, you know, and it's like everything I thought I knew about gaming was just immediately turned upside down. So when Richard described what would become Magic the Gathering to me, it was that same moment again, like, you know, to be lucky, you know, to be fortunate enough to have that moment twice in your life is quite a thing. And of course, to be honored with the person that he's pitching it to say, hey, would you publish this thing? And I'm like, yeah so how does that obviously you know like you said you thought you you thought that creating cards would be a relatively easy task let's talk about that so what ultimately happens is richard comes to you with this brand new idea it's not like you can look up in the phone book and be like well who's going to be printing this brand set of cards with randomized uh, cards on it and different art and stuff like that tell me about like what adventure you and Richard and the other Wizards of the Coast uh, members went on after this idea came to you? Yeah, well, <clears throat> we identified uh, several things that were going to be big challenges, we called them, uh, uh, big problems to solve. And uh, that any one of these things, if we couldn't solve it, you know, we, we'd be dead in the water. And, you know, R Richard's was, hey, before we get too excited I need to design this game. I, I just have this idea for a game. I haven't designed it. You know, I just came to you as soon as I had an idea, you know, and he was probably feeling like he jumped the gun maybe a little bit because I'm getting so excited. 
So that's interesting. I just want to I just want to highlight that. So Richard came to you and pitched the idea of what would essentially be the trading card game distribution model, but without a game behind it. So there was nothing to really pick it up. He hadn't quite married it with that five magics that you mentioned earlier. Well, I think he had the five magics in mind. I think he knew it was going to be fantasy. I think he knew there was going to be five magic, but but he hadn't actually sat down and designed the game, you know, like, you know, so he described it as like, okay, this is going to be a card game. But instead of a standard deck of cards, there's going to be hundreds of cards, maybe someday thousands of cards, which were there, right? Uh, and that, in, in fact, you might play a game and run across a card you've never seen before, which just kind of boggled our minds, right? And each card has its own mechanics. And the thing is, is that when you build, you build a deck, you decide out of all the cards you've collected, which cards put in your deck, and your opponent has done that. And then you play your your decks against each other, and that the fact that it's the combination of this deck and this deck that creates its own unique combi uh, um, combination, right? And also some of the cards would be rarer, you know. And he's just rattling through all these features that are that are not specifically game design, but they're game features of what a uh, what any collectible card, any you know, Pokemon, you could describe Pokemon the same way, right? The tenets of the genre, you know, the the key points that sort of make it that particular type of game. <clears throat> right, exactly, right. So he goes on this description, and just based on this description, I'm like, I I, I literally started hooping and hollering. That's how excited I was, <laughs> which which made him start hooping and hollering, and then our friend got worried that I'd run over him on it with a pickup. Or, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Well, a good thing that you uh, recognize good uh, opportunities when they come up or good ideas. You know, I think that there is a thread to, um, to thread there where, you know, you were appealed by the creativity of Dungeons and Dragons and you were appealed by the imagination as well. And that those sort of ideas sort of and the exploration of Dungeons and Dragons as well and all those same sort of fundamental ideas are present in Magic the Gathering. You know, you can be creative when building a deck and you can be creative when exploring the world, you know, rather than in your imagination on the cards that as they're played. So this idea, you know, so this was one of the problems. So the, you know, I mentioned there were several big problems. So one of the big problems was exactly what you said, which is how do we get this thing printed? You know, because a publisher doesn't, you know, it's like, oh, we knew that we that the technology existed for randomizing cards because trading card companies like Flair and Tops and these, these companies are making sports cards, which are kind of part of our model. Um, but we're also looking at those cards and going, these cards are kind of flimsy or maybe they're nice with holograms, but they're not nice in the way that a, a proper poker deck has nice cards with a plastic finish that shuffle really well. We didn't even know it was plastic. I mean, in our own naive words, we're like, but they've got to be nice, like poker deck, you know. And and those companies aren't making trading cards. Like, how do you find a company that does both? And how do you even? This is before Google. There's no way to go doing searches for this. And so it was a lot of. You just talk to people you knew, you know, you talk, I started talking to people in the tabletop gaming industry. Have you ever heard of a company that could do this? And I mean, I talked to everybody looking for someone who does something like this. I didn't want, I didn't know anybody in the trading card category, but I didn't want to talk to anybody in the trading card category anyway, because as soon as you have an idea like this, you're terrified somebody else is thinking the same idea and, and that you're in a race now to see who gets the market first, you know. And they've got the things, you know, the systems in place already and stuff. So uh, to jump forward a little bit in the story, obviously, you know, uh, I don't know how many people listening would know this off by hand, but uh, Magic initially gets printed in Belgium. So you have to go all the way across the sea and into Europe. Tell me about how that ends up happening. Right. So I had told a bunch of people I knew in the gaming industry that I was looking for a way to make these cards. And um, at Gen Con in 1992, uh, Mark Reinhagen, who was from White Wolf, who was one of the co-designers of Vampire the Masquerade, the original, also Lars Mager, kind of a bunch of other stuff, brilliant guy. He comes over to me and says, Peter, I found your guy. I'm like, what? What guy? You know, like, like I said, the guy that can make your card game. Uh, you know, he's over at our booth. You'll write, you'll you'll find him right away. He's the only person here at Gen Con is wearing a suit. Businessman. I went over and uh I met this guy, Luke Mertens. And sure enough, he was a guy, he was here drumming up card business, you know, for selling cards in America, uh, as a printer in Europe. Uh, Carta Monday, based in Belgium. Was he trying to pitch 
the idea of like randomized cards at that point or just anything for gaming? Oh, no. Yeah. He was just doing sales calls, you know, say, hey, we're a printer. You got, you need to make cards, you know, let us know. So he, you know, when he met with Mark Reinhagen, I don't know the substance of that conversation, but Mark Reinhagen told him, hey, wait here. I know a guy who, you know, needs what you do. Because evidently, Mark asked him about sorting cards um, because uh, when I sat down with Luke, um, he had an idea of of what we wanted to do, some sort of crossover between playing cards and, and trading cards. Um, and so, you know, I explained the idea. I made him play the game, which he think, he to this day thinks that was the funniest part of the story because he doesn't play games. It's like, no, Peter made me play magic because, like, you, it's the only way you're really going to understand. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. You know what you need. You know how the, the different things you can explore and stuff. And at that stage, obviously, as we're talking about, there was no printed cards. It was just index cards or, or whatever or like in that sense yeah yeah we were just using uh uh play test cards so richard richard made hundreds uh probably thousands of play test cards that you know that, at the local kinkos just cutting them up uh about the size of of you know smaller than a regular playing card you know like some of the smaller cards you might see in a board game anyway so um so i explained the whole idea to luke and luke is just like yeah we can do that you know he was very understated yeah yeah no problem it was a belgian accent no problem we can do that Sure. Yeah. We, we, and it turned out that they were primarily a casino quality playing card company. That's primarily what they did. And, but they had made a foray into trading cards years early and it, it didn't work out for them, but they still had the machine to do sorting of uh, ran, the randomization. I put it in quotes because it's not truly random. The randomization of trading cards, they still had the machine to do that, you know, that in the back of the warehouse somewhere so that's unbelievable so your all your problems were solved with this one meeting just by some again almost like happenstance moment yeah even problems we didn't know we had like we had no idea that i mean we we didn't know how we were going to package them we didn't know anything about the whole printing thing you know and uh right and we were, we were in the, my office at the time the wizard's office was the basement of my house that i was renting from a landlord i mean <laughs> it's yeah, I'm sure we made quite the impression, Rans. I'm definitely sure you did indeed. And obviously, you know, that solves your one big problem of how to make these things. But now you've got to figure out what to put on them. So tell us about what happens then. Like you're obviously going into, you know, you know, you had all these artists in mind. Um, tell us about what happens between sort of solving that one issue and then jumping into the next. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. That, that was uh, that was another one of the big problems uh, was <laughs> like, OK, I conceptually believed that we could get, you know, a bunch of fantasy art. I didn't realize it'd be, I mean, how many cards are in alpha? 250 some. I, yeah, I used to know these numbers. Uh, so, you know, 250 pieces of art was like, oh, I, I don't know if we get that much art. Uh, but we had, um, Jesper Mirfors had started doing contract work for us by this time. Uh, yes, of course, who's famous uh, in Magic circles now as the original art director for Magic the Gathering. Um, he had come because we had a license, we had acquired the rights to produce Talislana, which is a role playing game line, and he was a big Talislana fan. And so he just like called us out of the blue and like, I love Talislana. I'm so excited it's coming back. Uh, can I do art? Like I'll do free art. I'll come down. Whatever you need, you know. Yeah. So he just showed it up at, at our office and started making art for us of course as we had money we started paying him we didn't exploit him <laughs> there's only so many talus lana books he can take at one time for uh for payment there i'm sure yeah so it was several months later um and we got to be good friends and he was uh doing an amazing job and we hey Jesper, we got this other project but now we because we, we were very careful who we told because he worked for us for months and no idea we were working on magic off on the side and so we finally brought him into the circle of trust and, and said, we got this thing where we're going to need like 250 pieces of art. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can do it. No problem. I mean, he was very can do like, yeah. So he he had, was just graduating from Cornish, which is an art school in Seattle. And as an as an artist himself, and he's like an artist who loves other people's art, too. So he was a collector of art. He a he knew art. He was classically trained in art and he knew art. So he was able to, you know, very quickly throw out a net 
and approach a whole bunch of fantasy artists and saying, hey, we can't pay much, but we got this thing and um, uh, it's it's exciting. And, you know, wouldn't you like to do some art? And, and you know, in, in, in small pieces, these are five, you know, the original magic art was mostly done on a, uh, a like a five foot by five inch by seven inch sort of um, uh, size, which is not a real big piece of art to paint. Also, Richard uh, uh, Jesper's vision of magic art would that it would be what he called iconic, which would focus on the object or the person and let the background kind of mute out, kind of like shooting a, a camera with a shallow depth of field, um, where and um, which I I really liked. But both of those factors combined made the art pretty pretty efficient for the artist, right? And so, yeah, so he got a whole bunch of artists uh, signed up to this thing, including half a dozen people they went to school with it at Cornish. And I, I probably might be misremembering exactly who that was, but I think it was Anson, I think Mark Tadine, Sandra Everingham, uh, um, Nicola Beeson, maybe. I'm not sure exactly, but it um, a lot of the very first, probably half of the very first match artists were just people he knew in Seattle. Well, how fortuitous is that? You know, this guy's come to you for this passion for this other project and he's fallen into this role. He's got all these contacts that can that can find all these things. Like so many things have to go right so far. You found the printer that can do randomized cards, the only one probably in the world at that stage. It was absolutely just so amazing. So let's let's zoom up a little bit because I mean, it's just miracle after miracle after miracle here. But let's hit it until you actually are holding that miracle. What happens when you first sort of, you know, you've got all your art squared away. You've got the rules all sorted. You've got the production sorted out. You've made the little book for the starter decks and stuff like that. What happens when you hold that first magic card? Tell me about experiencing that for the very first time. I, I will, but I got to respond to what you said about miracle after miracle after miracle. And you, you mentioned I'm a humble person. I don't think I'm overly humble, but I'm aware that when people start saying, oh, Peter Atkinson, you're so great. You've done all these things. It's like, I got really fucking lucky. I, <laughs> I mean, there's I I am very aware of how much luck was involved in all this coming together and how much of it really Richard deserves the lion's share of the credit for coming up with the whole idea. Otherwise, Wizard of the Coast would just be yet another long forgotten RPG company from the 90s, you know. So, uh but yeah, the story of holding the cards is a fun story. I had um you know, we had a, you know, we eventually set off all, sent off all the the, the production materials, the pre-press sheets, all stuff like that to get it printed, you know. And and then it's like a three or four month process to get the cards made and then they get shipped to me. I'm not at that point aware, although if I thought about it, I should have been, that of course the production is going in stages and they're not printing all the cards on day one and then, you know, and it, it that, you know, the stuff flows through. And so it was actually at least a month, a month and a half before magic was supposed to be done that Richard, I mean, that Luke called me and said, Hey, Peter, the first magic cards are printed. Would you like me to send you some? I mean, it's like, yeah, we, whoa, I mean, yes, you have magic cards. Yes. I'd love to see some. Meanwhile, your index cards have gotten a little ratty in the in the years in between. Um, I said, okay, well, um, I'm about ready to go to Origins, which is a tabletop games convention that used to move around. And that year it was in Dallas, Fort Worth. And um, so uh, there's no hurry. I won't, won't be able to see him until I get back next week. And Luke's like, I'll just send him to your hotel. Would you know where you're staying? You know, he's very matter of fact. And, you know, we were so young and naive. So many little things would just amaze us. Like the idea that you could send something to yourself at a hotel. <laughs> that's why he that's why he was the one wearing the suit. Yeah, that's why I mean I was raised on a farm, Rand. I mean, everything about this journey was like a wide opening surprise. And so, yeah, send him to my hotel. Sure, Luke. Great idea. So I go to and and it just by coincidence, Richard was going with me to Origins that year. And uh, I, I'm not sure who else, maybe Lisa. Yeah. Uh, so we went to we went to Origins and on day two or so of the show, sure enough, we get this white box, just like the white boxes you buy in sport card, you know, companies, you know, um, small one. And it had uh, a bunch of cards in it. And it, it, of course, they're not distributed like common, uncommon, rare. It was just 
like all the cards off of each of those three sheets, right? So there wasn't really enough land. <laughs> and, and, and there were way too many of the rare cards. <laughs> Mostly moxes and black lotuses or something like that from, from the rare sheet. Get this black lotus out of here. Jeez, use it once and it's gone. How, what good is that? You know? Yeah. So yeah, I was so happy to see them. And it was, it's hard to describe the moment when you first hold your baby, you know? You know, it's been years creating this thing and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you've you realized it. It's happened. You know, all those miracles have added up to this piece of cardboard in front of you. That's amazing. Yeah, it's all the hard work gets you there. Then the question is, is it going to sell? No. Well, that's a great point to what I want to bring up next. So tell me about what presenting this game was like. You know, obviously you had it for Origins. You were able to demo it to some capacity, you know, throwing away moxes and stuff like that just to land, just to get through a, a play test. Uh, but tell me about like what it was like showing this to retailers and distributors who previously were only familiar with things like regular trading cards. Like this this game component element was obviously very confusing because, you know, if you buy a box of games from Steve Jackson, you get everything. Why would I want only a piece of the action in this particular case? And what was their opinion of that sort of thing? Well, yeah, it was not an easy sell. I mean, it it kind of, I mean, ultimately it was an easy sell because the game was so good and it caught on and, and word of mouth became really the primary reason that it got sold and got so big. But initially you're trying to get people to try it. And there is this, there is a, whether it's a, a, a gamer that you're pitching at a convention directly to consumers or whether it's a retailer or a distributor who understands that gamer well enough to say basically the same thing, which is, okay, people aren't going to like the idea that everybody has to have their own game. You know, people expect to buy a card game, just one, and sh play that game with their friends. And they're not going to like the idea that the game doesn't include all the cards. You know, like what? It doesn't include all the cards? So, of course, these things end up being very positive things because it drives collectability and chasing those valuable cards and so on and so forth. But that's not the way anybody looked at it at, at the time. I found that, though, really... The the major selling point at the very beginning is if you just put a bunch of cards on the table, people walk by and like it goes back to the art. People walk by and like, like, wow, what game is this? Because they'd look down and see, like, if you put out 50 pieces, you could put out 50 cards on a table and fan them out and place them out or play in a game, see, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 cards at once. And a lot of them have different art. And it's all in color. And you got to, we don't realize what it was like in 1993. There wasn't a lot of fantasy art in color that you could enjoy. If you were a fantasy art um, fan, if you were a fan of fantasy art, you knew every piece that ever got published. I mean, every piece that had ever been published, you saw it and you remembered it. Like, I, you know, oh, that's a Frank Rosetta. That's a Hildebrand. Yeah, that's an Easley or something like that. That's a Jeff Easley. Yeah, amazing. You know, Clyde Caldwell. I mean, Larry Elmore. I mean, there were definitely fantasy artists that we looked up to and revered, but we didn't see lots of their work. We just saw the few, you know. And so there was something about seeing all this fantasy art on the table and people going, what is this game, you know? And then he explained the game and then, uh, you know, it goes on from there. Well, imagine for a gamer, it's almost like seeing that, you know, that it's that entering Oz moment. You know, it's like everything's turned to color because, you know, you're used to seeing RPG pages that are all just in, you know, pencil sketches and, and you know, black and white and stuff like that. But this game is, you know, it's got those five colors. All the art was very vibrantly, like, attached to those colors as well. Like a, a blue card would have shades of blue and everything in it. Obviously, Jesper's, te uh, Jesper's texturing and stuff like that obviously assisted all of those things. And it was such an eye-grabbing game. Well, and, and also, it was edgy. It was, it was... It was edgier than the TSR art, or the or the uh, the books covers that you'd find at a bookstore, right? So you're seeing Anson Maddox, you know, and his Lanawar elves, you know, and Sandra Abraham's Dark Ritual, and you know, you're seeing the demonic tutor. You're seeing like, oh, this this is edgy, you know that. That also was a point of differentiation uh, immediately. Definitely some of those earlier cards look a lot more like uh, Black Sabbath covers or Iron Maiden covers than they do like, you know, uh, Dragonlance covers. 
exactly so uh okay so you pitched this game you've sold it to you know retailers and you've got distributors sort of on board word of mouth is starting to chug along um what was it like to see this creation of yours you know to coin the phrase that borrow the phrase you used earlier this baby of yours get picked up like wildfire and spread amongst gaming culture like unlike anything that you'd probably witnessed firsthand well i mean you know as a as an entrepreneur you know of course that's incredibly exciting you know like uh you know you, you love it when your numbers are skyrocketing up and to the right i i think i probably became a bit of a recluse in the sense that instead of you know once it started taking off by word of mouth and everybody else was out talking about how great it was <clears throat> most of my challenges were internal to the organization you know how do you how do you grow the company to keep up with the insane growth of of how fast the company is growing you know we grew from um a hundred thousand or dollars in sales in 92 to 2 million in 93 to 57 million in 94 to 113 million in 95 you know uh that's crazy crazy growth and i was um and it was hard because i was completely out to see about how to run a uh, run a business i mean i i did not come from a business background i was i had a computer science degree from college I didn't come from a wealthy family. I grew up on a farm, like I said. One of the things about business is, you know, people can say that, uh, you know, failure is obviously a big thing, but success can sometimes lead to a downfall as well. And if you're unprepared for that, obviously you guys pivoted in such a wild way. So you have all these successes. Tell me about, you know, sort of some of the things that start to change. You know, you've taken this role from being like, you know, basically a production sort of guy you know, handling all the production things to being sort of the head of a corporation, you know, like a big business sort of in the space of less than a, you know, less than a year, really a little over a year. Tell me about how, what that experience was like for you. No, it was, um, uh, yeah, it was really challenging. I think, um, I think business is hard period, you know, uh, whether it's a small business, a big business, if it's a growing business, it's a failing business, business is just hard. And, uh, so I, it was definitely a learning curve for me. Uh, it was a lot of painful learning. Uh, it was, I did, um, at one point, I actually, during the height of magic, explosive growth and everything's going great, I was actually really depressed uh, a lot because I was so overwhelmed. I was feeling so incompetent at business. I was feeling like all these crazy challenges and I don't know how to do my job. And um, I was fortunate in that one of my board members uh, suggested I you know, pointed out that the local university, uh, University of Washington here, has an executive MBA program. And it's designed for people who have full-time jobs who are already in executive levels of management. It says, this, this is prime for you. You should go take this and you'll learn a lot about business. And it, it the classes are designed to fit your schedule and that it's like, two days a week all day. And one of those days overlaps a weekend, you know, and then once in a while there's a residency. And, and um, so I did that and it was huge. I, I would not have, you know, survived that period of my life, at least at, I would not have survived that job and kept that job as CEO of Wizards of the Coast through the nineties. If I wouldn't have had that idea uh, offered to me and got out and taken it. And cause it like, Within within two weeks at of being enrolled in that program, I suddenly got like, oh wow, I can do this. Like, okay, okay. Like, like I I'm learning cool things so fast that um I fired my COO and went from there. Well, I mean, it, it threads back to, you know, you being overwhelmed by Dungeons and Dragons in the first place, and then finally getting someone to show you how to play it and sort of, you know, learning how it all works together and understanding the rules and the system and stuff like that. And then it's opened up this whole world for you in that regard. Yeah, I think it was um, something about, fair, I, at some point I, I realized that a business was basically a, a complex board game. And, you know, and you know how you, in a board game, you're often, you know, playing with different resources, like here, I can get this here and that here, trading things, you have a strategy, you have tactics, you have all these things. And it just kind of fit, fell into place at one point of looking at a business as like a game. And, you know, your, your winning criteria, your score is, you know, return on investment to shareholders. That's so how do you maximize that? And that uh, once I figured out that was the game um, and not that I would treat it like a game, like I don't mean to imply that I was 
trivializing what we were doing or that, you know, employees or partners of ours were playthings. I don't mean any of that. Just in terms of thinking about the modeling of the business and and how to structure it in my head. Yeah, it helped it click for you. I understand that indeed. Now, I mean, it's really interesting. Obviously, you uh, were benef- like obviously benefiting and, you know, you sort of had to repivot yourself. You know, you started this because you wanted to be a gamer. You didn't want to be a businessman. You wanted to be somebody who created and shared games with the world. But obviously, you know, things fell upon uh, you in very fortunate ways. You know, what do they say? It's a good problem to have. But my interesting question there is it wasn't just you guys that started benefiting. All of a sudden, hobby gaming changed the face of it like you know everything from uh you know other companies started to do uh collectible card game model things there was companies that popped up and stores that popped up that were being supported essentially by the sale of things like magic cards or you know trading card games or accessories for magic cards as well tell me about what your experience was as somebody who had come from this hobby way back 10 years ago what was it like to watch you know the the entire industry change shape around this product that you guys had put out well, that was very exciting. You know, the, you know, say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, right? So uh, there were many, many uh, trading card games that uh, or companies that rushed trading card games to market, you know, within within a year of Magic coming out. I think Spellfire came out. I think that was the first competitor. Um, you know, not long after that, you have Legend of the Five Rings. We even competed against ourselves by producing other trading card games like, um, you know, Battletech and Netrunner and Jihad and or a, a vampire and so these um uh that's exciting to see it become a category uh it was there were surreal moments like the first time i became aware that there were people businesses that were only online not actual stores who were buying magic cards opening them up and then reselling singles at like Oh wow! Like like here's somebody who started a business because of magic and is making a living at it, which I love. I mean, the role of business is provide jobs. That's our role in society: provide productive employment. You know, so I love, I love it when people can work in tabletop games in some way and earn a living at it. And the more people that can do that, is my measure of feeling good about tabletop gaming, right? And so, like, uh, not to get into too much of a tangent, but, like, recently there have been, like, people have been questioning, like, should we have celebrities, you know, uh, people who are celebrity dungeon masters on Twitch? And, like, yes, those people are making money in tabletop games. More people making money and finding a livelihood in this industry that we love so much. That's That's just good. That's better, right? So... The fact that we opened up opportunities for new businesses, for new employees and new divisions of companies and stuff like that. I was also, though, very aware of the pain, too, that came in uh, cases because, you know, it came, you know, magic came in like the Titanic. I mean, that's a bad. It's still afloat. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It it came in like a very large monster on a, you know, on a a field with a lot of of, um, people that, got stepped on got hurt and you know so i would that's always you know you're you're aware of the pain that comes with growth as well but that is that is endemic to it the net net is that magic the gathering contributed to a lot of people's happiness and success and even though there were a lot of trading card games that came out a lot of them didn't make it but you mentioned pokemon earlier that one did and Yu-Gi-Oh. Legend of the Five Rings stayed around for a really long time. Absolutely. I think one of the things is you guys had sort of spent that time sort of crafting this product and figuring out how to do this new genre of gaming. This wasn't just another, you know, product that somebody could just rush out. It needed to be maintained. It needed to be grown. It needed to be nurtured in such a way. And those games that you mentioned there all got nurtured in that sense of sense. And and just to, just to circle back to where you were before, I wasn't planning on asking about this, but obviously, you know, you mentioned about, you know, people who are online, the internet was becoming a thing, you know, that sort of helped, I'm sure, foster the growth of the game, you know, people could trade deck building tips online, and it sort of became a lifestyle and culture. But where I did want to draw the line there in their question is, you guys obviously weren't, you know, you were selling randomized packs, right? But there was a secondary market that sort of evolved out of just the nature of that game. You know, somebody wanted a Lotus more than they wanted, you know, a Brawl Worm or something like that. Um, Tell me about like what that was like to see. And was that something you ever expected before the game had sort of come out? 
um, <clears throat> we didn't. We knew that we hoped that there would be, you know, a vibrant community. You know, people who hanging out at the local game store who would trade the cards. You know, uh, the idea that it be that the trading started happening on the internet on a mass scale was beyond our imagining. Um, and uh, but you know, you mentioned that you know the technology. It was another case of us being really fortunate in that we were a tech savvy company relative to other companies in 1993. And, and we were on all the chat places, you know, okay, no social media, but there had AOL had a forums and Usenet had a forums. And, you know, there were several places, there were half a dozen places where CompuServe had, uh, and, and so there were half a dozen places out there where people could create topics and talk about things. And magic became a really big topic in this space. And that was really exciting. You know, it was pretty cool. And I also want to mention before I forget, you talked about the influence that magic had. Uh, something that I, I think you'll agree with, but a lot of people don't think about it, is that the competitive play of Magic the Gathering, the organized play program, the tournaments, the Pro Tour and the World Championships and stuff like that, the and us learning how to televise those and do the deal that we did with ESPN2 and have the pro tour events broadcast on television was really a first. I mean, there was some of that with chess and, and so on and so forth, but um, you know, the setup that was used for televising a game, uh, that was the setup we came up with was directly copied for the World Series of Poker. I mean, we we had an influence on that, and it's an esports. I think I, I I will make the claim that the roots of esports go back to Magic the Gathering. Oh, absolutely! Like you said, I mean, obviously chess is a different beast, but you know, this is a this is a game that has a you know like a geeky meta and stuff like that, where where people can get together and discuss and watch it and stuff like you know, much like League of Legends does nowadays. It, it definitely has echoed forward into our culture, and that was probably one of the things that was really revolutionary that you guys sort of had the finger on the button about. Yeah, that's uh, um, another another miracle. <laughs> to coin the term now i do want to circle back you mentioned before about competing with yourself you know we talked about a bunch of other trading card games coming out from other companies but at some point you guys wanted to sort of explore other themes you wanted to explore other sort of worlds you know we mentioned them in the introduction there was a number of other games that you sort of dubbed um if anybody looks at the back of a magic card like the ones behind me here is going to see the words deck master tell me about what your vision was uh you know before magic came out or even after magic came out for that line and and what your hopes were in that sense yeah well we um uh especially as magic took off and became obvious that this was a thing um we uh all of that was built on the false premise <laughs> that uh that the first game we did probably wouldn't be that good and that we'd have that we should do more because we'd get better at it i mean little did we know <laughs> that that the first game magic the gathering you know 30 years later pretty much everybody agrees it's the best. I mean, like nobody's been able to to touch it, you know, really. And um, uh, so we wanted to be the, the first competitors that did better than Magic. We wanted our games to be the ones that, that killed Magic, right? If anybody was. And so, you know, Magic's barely out the door and, you know, we're getting, um, we're designing new trading card games. And um, we also... And this also kind of represents, um, you know, being such a tiny company, to, given how small we were at the start, companies, brands like Battletech and Vampire and Netrunner to us were these big brands that we could license those brands and and get the power of those brands to leverage us into that those segments of the market. And also perhaps stem off those particular publishers from competing against us right so uh so that was that was the strategy i mean and and it was fine and it was fun and everything you know in a very purist you know harvard business school sort of analysis would say that we should never have done anything other than magic right as soon as magic came out we should have just 
quit even thinking about doing any other games and just be the magic company until we got the chance to buy Dungeons and Dragons. So. Like you said, you want to explore the space and who, who you know, very few people think that their first try at something is going to be the, you know, the giant way to go. Right. Yeah. I mean, Richard was, I mean, I remember Rich, I don't know how he feels now. It's, you know, this, this was back in the nineties that he, there was a point in time at least where he thought that Netrunner was the best game he ever designed. To draw the parallel, very few film directors have their fa- their first movie be their absolute best one. Right, <laughs> exactly. So I do want to ask about then, uh, okay, so ultimately, you know, you're these guys, you're, you sort of started building up steam, magic's becoming this big thing. And you mentioned them before, obviously TSR is going to enter the market with Spellfire. Did that cause you any concern before it had come out? Were you nervous that the, you know, the, the standard bearer for hobby gaming was entering with their own game at that point? Oh yeah, nervous as hell and, and, until we played it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I think everybody else felt the same way as well. And then they tried it out. You know, you've got all that reused art and stuff like that uh, as well. So w- what we see is we see all these uh, games sort of coming out. You know, like we said, we mentioned almost every other hobby game had one. Eventually, and this is jumping forward a little bit, but eventually you guys sort of start work on something that's really revolutionary in gaming. Uh, and I don't know uh, an example of how, if it's ever happened before or since, but essentially you guys start exploring the idea of patenting uh, the trading card game method of play. Tell us about where that idea came from, why you guys wanted to do that, what you thought uh, the value is in an in, in, uh, in endeavor like that. Uh, yeah, well, we started that process actually almost right away. Um, the um, uh, It just takes a long time to kind of play that out. Or, or, um, so <clears throat> it was clear to us that Magic the Gathering was very unique, right? I mean, like, this is totally, this is like, a. it's like Dungeons and Dragons all over again. It's like some, it, this is, this is something. It should be patentable. It should be protectable by a patent. It's like, a, you know, it's, it's like an invention. So we certainly uh, believed that that was true. Uh, we started working on a patent and we got, we filed a patent, we got the patent approved. Um, and we never wanted to, go out and use that to you know crush the little guys um but um uh we certainly thought that um if somebody was going to make a trading card game using this idea that we had come up with that um that we should get a a taste and so uh yeah so i i i it's it's easy to be a little idealistic and kind of you know eschew the idea of of patents as as some bad thing but i i think it's a, i think patents are a good thing and so uh yeah we didn't we didn't hesitate we went for it but we didn't you know we didn't ever go after the little guys we just uh basically went after we just tried to get um we, we got royalties on a regular basis from uh konami eventually for um uh for Yu-Gi-Oh. oh okay yeah yeah and with pokemon i mean those were the two big the two biggest competitors of course with pokemon we ended up um distributing it so as part of our distribution agreement we didn't have you know they didn't have to turn around and pay us back royalties so well i mean definitely uh might have been part of the good decision to go with you guys at that point i'm sure yeah i think uh, i feel i well i i really value the the relationship we had with um uh with uh uh with the pokemon people uh with nintendo with creatures with mr mr ishihara uh, we had a great rec- relationship with them. Really enjoyed working with them. I and they had an amazing game. They have an amazing game. They have an amazing strategy of tying it to anime and to children's cartoons. And uh, I think yes, I think we did a great job of distributing it uh, throughout. Our our initial deal was in the U.S. only, and by the time I left the company, we had distribution rights to all of the world except Japan and all languages but Japanese. Wow. I mean, I'm sure, it, it, well, my generation, an entire generation agrees with that sentiment that you guys did an amazing job, you know, uh, for for schoolyards, lunch hours and everything like that, you know, kids were playing those games forever and, you you know, we came up on TCGs because of a game like that. And I do want to circle back to that later, but I did have a couple of final questions about Magic the Gathering, especially because we touched on things like uh, the secondary market and we touched on uh, some really interesting things. Magic went through some te- teething problems. Obviously, you know, it's been covered in many places, but Fallen Empires was a big 
debacle, you know, with the way that the distributors handled it and the retailers sort of ordered it, over ordered and stuff. And, and the way we handled it, the way all of us handled it. Of course, of course. I mean, you know, that's just the thing with teething problems, right? Like it's always about newness and, and stuff like that. One of the biggest sticking points still today, and it, it stretches all the way back to, you know, your tenure at, uh, at uh, Wizards of the Coast is uh, something called the reserve list, which is a, a, a limited list of cards that you know essentially were promised not to be reprinted did you have any perspective on that how that came about why that was put in place um or anything was it just something you weren't even aware of oh i was aware of it uh and it it's um i have to admit you know the memory is a little foggy uh in terms of uh one of the things that's challenging to remember is when a decision is complicated and you go through iterations in your thought process. And then years later, you try to remember and you don't always do a good job of remembering kind of where things landed at the end. It's like, uh, it's if you talk to game designers, they'll, they'll um, every game designer can remember, uh, uh, will sympathize with this because game designers often don't know the rules of their own game because they play tested all the ver the versions through the playtest process and sometimes forget what got published, you know. Uh, but I, I remember feeling that uh, in general at WOTC, uh, at the core of WOTC, and I, I, I really want to point out Richard and Scaff Elias and myself, who um, those were the two people I went to the most in terms of talking business strategy. And of course, there were a lot of other people that had very valuable insights and were part of part of the process. Um, and the three of us definitely had a bias toward the players and not to collectors so much as especially speculators, people that will buy product and just flip it. And, um, uh, you know, so our I think our feelings were very tainted by some of the early magic behavior where you know we're trying to get magic cards retailed at 250 a pack and it's showing by the time it gets to retail it's 10 bucks a pack and you think oh that horrible retailer um you know jacked up the price well maybe it was the distributor that jacked up the price or maybe the retailer went across town and bought from one of his competitors at seven bucks a pack and now selling them at nine so you have to be really careful who you point fingers to and um so we tended to really want to side with the gamers over every other interest. Um, but the reserve list was this nod to, hey, this collecting market is also important. And there's a lot of people that have paid big prices for these cards based on an implied agreement or to some extent partially articulated agreement um, that we were going to print many more of these cards, and so we, we gotta we gotta honor that, right? And so, uh, and at the end of the day, it's part of the magic of magic. I mean, the fact that you know there's black lotuses out there selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, that's hard to not think. That's kind of cool if you're the guy that created Magic the Gathering. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely a legacy and, you know, it stretches back to, you know, what we were talking about before with the secondary market and, and you know, it's it's a product that continues to give back sometimes in different places than we were expecting, but it continues to give back all these years later. And like you said, it builds the esteem and the legendary status of those particular items. And I appreciate your candor there uh, telling me about that. And and I really want to speak to something you said there. You said that at one point, you know, you and, and Scaff Elias, who was a play tester that worked with Richard and Richard sort of decided that you guys wanted to focus on the players. And after, you know, things like, uh, you know, the reserve list was put in place, you guys really did sort of pivot away from that more into this like sort of pro tour, this sort of intellectual sport side of thing. Tell me uh, what your, what your thoughts were sort of, you know, you know, we sort of discussed it before, you know, you, it was a, a, pre, pre, uh, a forerunner for esports, but tell me about like, you know, what that process was putting something like the pro tour in place. Well, I, I first of all, I want to thank you Rands for, you know, sort of being clever enough with magic history to come up with this question and, and, and pose it because I do a lot of these interviews and this is a topic that doesn't come up very often. And I, I think it's a very interesting one. Um, and it was, um, there was a, a rift in the company, which was basically Richard and Scaff and I against almost everybody else who really wanted to preserve this idea that cards were rare. Mm -hmm. And 
Scaff and Richard and I, uh, only three of us, but fortunately, you know, between the three of us owned most of the company, uh, were like, no, our strategy is that when we come out with a boot, we want to get to the place where we come out with a new expansion uh, that the prices are at the price that we freaking said, two fifty or a dollar seventy five, whatever the price is, three fifty, you know, whatever that MSRP is, that's where the price should be, and gamers should be able to buy the packs for that price, and it should be that way for like a year, and then I mean we don't reprint it, and then eventually yeah the price will start going up because the collectors, but there should be that, and we and we can't go back in time and do anything about the lotuses and all the boxes and the reserve lists, all those cards, but. We can start to manage the game. This is our conversation to ourselves in 1995, I guess. Um, we can start to manage this game in a way that gamers can get the cards at a reasonable price when a new cards come out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's where we want to be. It was not a popular decision. And we uh and up until that moment. The game Magic had a, a big branding problem and well, opportunity, I should say, of being about speculation and flipping cards and making a quick buck and all this sort of stuff. And sometimes we confuse that with the more you know, the collector that's not trying to do. I mean, for a long time, speculator and collector were the same word to me. And it took me a while to suss out that really I shouldn't. I, it's really those speculators I don't like. Uh, somebody that just buys the cards and likes them and wants to collect them all. Engages in trading and swapping and stuff like that. And we should be nurturing that group into this other group. And so we realized that we needed, and I was you know, just starting to get into business school, right? We need to do a rebranding effort. <laughs> so we need to reposition, and this is exactly what we did, exactly what we said we would do. We need to reposition the Magic the Gathering brand from being about collecting and speculating to being about organized play, an intellectual sport. This is about competition. And that's what we want the game to be about. And uh, I I think, you know, we've had a recurring theme in our conversation today, Rand's about miracles. I'm really proud of this moment because I think it's the moment in time where we, where we were smart. I mean, that, not, I'm, that doesn't sound too humble, does it? So, because I... I think, I mean, I think, I think that you guys were smart and you guys, uh, you guys were all started as gamers, right? And, and you weren't chasing that, you know, you were, you were content with how much you were making and stuff like that. You didn't need to push that button, but eventually, you know, you guys started to explore, you know, glorifying the ability, the skill that this game had. It wasn't just cards in a packet. It was, it was something that people could do to actually stimulate themselves, you know, intellectually. Yeah. And so we, you know, so we designed a marketing campaign. And the cornerstone of it was the organized play program with rankings and ratings and qualifying tournaments, the whole structure. And we rolled it out and it worked and we repositioned it from this, uh, from this, you know, uh, collectibles, flippable games, you know, make a quick buck sort of brand to a brand that's all about tough intellectual competition. Now, we also, there were people that were disappointed in that older magic was simpler it was more casual. There were certainly casual players who did not like the idea that Magic became more competitive. But, you know, in marketing strategies, you pick the customer that you want to focus on and you deliver to that and you message to that customer. And um, and that's what we did. I'm really, really happy for it. So there is a bunch of other questions I would love to ask, but I do want to sort of bridge over them because there is something I want to get to and it sort of circles back to where we were before. Um, Magic comes out. Obviously, we haven't even talked about the fact that you guys, you know, you briefly touched on it, but it became an international brand. It became, you know, you guys grew from basically the small company in Seattle to having offices all over the world. And eventually, you know, in places like Japan, which is very centric on gaming. And, and as we mentioned before, that's where Pokemon comes from. So tell me, Magic is this top dog in the trading card game world. What happens to sort of bridge, you know, your relationship uh, with the Pokemon company or whatever it was called at the time, Game Freak or whatever, and, and makes them approach you? Tell me about that sort of origin story of how Wizards of the Coast gets the, you know, the biggest coup in sort of kids gaming with Pokemon eventually uh once again i can't take any credit for it uh and no and and uh wizards can't really take any credit for it either i mean when 
uh, I remember my, I, I used to, we did a lot. First of all, we did a lot of business in Japan. We sold a lot of magic cards in Japan. At one point, point Japan was 30% of our worldwide sales. So it was as big as Europe. And, um, uh, and, and so I was going over there quarterly uh, to, um, uh, to visit our, our partner there. And um, I remember the day that Mr. Sato told me that um, he was very sad to report that Magic was no longer the number one trading card game in Japan, which had never happened. We'd never been anything but first in any market. And so then you feel that pang of like, oh, God, competition pang. You know, every business knows about competition pang, which is it's not so much that you're mad at somebody's doing a better job. You're just you're, you're worried about survival, you know, and you're worried about like, am I OK? Am I going to go out of business now? Is this the beginning of the end? That's the question. Yeah. Is this the beginning of the end? And uh, so, we, you know, and so we took a look at Pokemon and we very quickly realized, no, actually, this is targeted younger. It's more mass market. It's tied in with TV and the Game Boy. Let's not forget that was a very big piece of the Pokemon puzzle at the beginning. And 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 not too long after that, we also theorized, hey, this could actually be good for us because Pokemon's out there introducing the idea of a trading card game through mass media much more effectively than we are and bringing in kids into this. And then, you know, and then someday some of those will graduate into magic. Case in point, you know. Yeah, we were right. So um but we were uh, still kind of felt kind of, you know, pretty competitive towards, you know, be being kind of beat out by somebody, you know. And then we just get the call from out of the blue. Um, uh, I did from uh, Ishihara saying, hey, or probably a secretary, you know, memories will fight, saying, hey, um, we want to come visit you in Seattle. And we're like, you want to come? Okay, <laughs> sure. Come, come visit us in Seattle. We'd love to see you, right? So they... They came over and came to our offices and um, met with Richard and I and a bunch of the executive teams, very formal exchanging of gifts and stuff like what it used to be like to do business in Japan. And um, uh, and then Ishihara gave this eloquent speech thanking Richard for designing Magic the Gathering and thinking so highly of Magic the Gathering um, and that it was because of magic that it inspired him to do Pokemon and that Pokemon wouldn't exist except for magic. And then he ended it, would you like to be our distributor of Pokemon cards in the American market? And I'm sure you had to think about that for all of a couple of seconds. Yeah, we love Pokemon. Sure. <laughs> we love Pikachu. <laughs> Where's that photo of Pikachu? Put it up on the wall. Well, it's interesting to note that at that point, I don't think Pokemon was really what it was in, a, in the US yet. It, it hadn't really hit culturally yet well it hadn't launched in the u.s it was an unknown to us we were like we realized it was outselling us in japan but there was definitely a big question in our minds about whether or not it would sell in america because anime was uh, anime at that time was a, a niche i mean comic books were a niche and anime was a niche within comic books okay so i mean this is not something that most american children were into yeah. So we were a bit skeptical, but we knew that it was important. And also we um, uh, knew that Nintendo is part of the, you know, once we got into talking more seriously about deal terms and found out that Nintendo was going to put in $40 million of advertising Pokemon in the American market, we're like, well, we can we can sell cards off of that. I mean, for sure, even if nobody plays them, you know, that amount of marketing. So, uh, you know, so we... Um, so yeah, so we got into business and we forecasted like $5 million in sales and ended up being several hundred million dollars in sales. It's uh, definitely an interesting little coup there. Yeah, because I mean, obviously at that stage, you know, nowadays everyone's like, well, of course you want Pokemon. But, you know, it was weird monsters being caught. You know, are we going to have problems with PETA? You know, like where are these, you know, where are these lines going to lay between American culture and Japanese culture? And obviously it was for many people like myself, a big bridge builder. Now, obviously a Pokemon hits and we've talked a lot about how growth in a company can change things, how you had to sort of pivot as a as a businessman as as things got more and more increasingly uh you know successful. You know, Wizards of the Coast went from two million to fifty-seven million or whatever you said it was. Tell me about how that impact from Pokemon came into the company. Like how did that change the way you allocated resources? How did it change your perspective on 
what you were doing, you know, because I, by the sounds of it, and I don't want to guess at magic numbers, but it could have outsold magic very easily in those early years. So it was um, the shock. It was, it immediately took off bigger than magic. And so the growth challenges were back. It was reminiscent of 1994 all over again. Yeah. But, you know, we were in a better position to handle it. Um, I had uh, in 1997, when we acquired Dungeons and Dragons, TSR, um, I had hired my mentor, Vince Calori, to come in and be my um, uh, uh, COO. And um, because I, I fired the other guy. Right. And so uh, he came in. He was always I mean, he was a great business guy. And so he really took the brunt of the growing pains of that. And, you know, it was all printing and shipping and logistics and, and running out of the world supply of paper. <laughs> that, you know, little problems like that, but now we got through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I imagine I imagine it just would have been an amazing thing. Now, we talked about scarcity. We talked about collectability. We talked about, you know, servicing those different markets. And, and obviously, Pokemon, while it is a game, it doesn't have the same game of focus as, say, Magic the Gathering does. Um, how does your approach change? And something that I think is a, a uniquely Wizards of the Coast addition to the game, because you guys didn't design the game. You basically translated it and sort of, you know, I guess curated sets or something to that effect. But you did add first edition. Tell me about what the decision was there. Um, memory's a little foggy, but I, I, can, I can I can tell you that um, we had a definite um, you know we had a way of marketing magic that was about organized play, and there was definitely a sense, and, and some of that carried over, and we applied some of that to Pokemon uh, to varying levels of success. Um, I, I think, um, uh, but it was also part of what got us the, the deal. I mean, the Pokemon people wanted to see us running Pokemon tournaments and Pokemon in-store events. But we did over time kind of shift from being highly competitive to more social. Uh, you know, we had a, I, I just remember how crazy it was that we had, uh, you know, card game tournaments in Toys are us, you know. I mean, this it was unheard of, you know. <laughs> you know, so this this sort of thing. So um there was definitely um having to adjust our normal style of how we distributed or marketed uh magic to Pokemon. So uh it, it is interesting to sort of go through that pivot and see that that sort of there was a sort of a change there. Now, obviously, there's a million questions we can talk about Pokemon, but obviously at that point, you know, like you said, you guys weren't designing it, you were just bringing it in and sort of translating it. Let's just sort of wrap up, almost wrap up that sort of that sort of part of the conversation, but just with you sharing any other like crazy memories. Obviously, when you're doing, you know, nearly 400, 500 million dollars a year, like what's some of the craziest stuff you remember about your experience bringing Pokemon in, whether that's in Japan, whether that's in America? Tell me all about that i i think some of my uh one of my most crazy memories having to do with pokemon uh was selling in china oh interesting i don't know about this story tell me all about it so this is back in an era where it was hard to sell consumer goods into china um it just was it was more trade was more tightly controlled by the party and stuff but we had a guy um named jackson Chi who was a, um, a Chinese uh, businessman who was uh, successful in his own right, who um, who knew how to do it. And so uh, going through the process of getting um, authorization from the party, getting all the right palms greased to be able to uh, get magic authorized and Pokemon authorized uh, for, for sale into China, uh, because we were doing both by the time that we were uh, cracking this market um i it was great I, I got to go to beijing i got to have dinner with the mayor of beijing uh we it was very much part of the culture that you had to all take shots and um say something so there was like a like 12 of us around a table and they bring out a round of shots and it was somebody's turn and that person had to stand up and make a little speech and then we all had to drink the shots right well, like you, you can't say, i mean I mean, I'm fine with drinking, you know, <laughs> but I mean, you can't say no in that situation, yeah. you know. The mayor of Beijing actually fell asleep, like drunk, fell asleep, passed out with his head on my shoulder. <laughs> he just leaned over, put his head on my shoulder, and was out. Like, what do I do with this? I don't know. 
glad to be here. This is cool. I'm going to remember yeah, this exactly. moment. You're on the edge of an international incident. If you burp, you're on an international incident ready to happen. Yeah. And he, you know, and I also say, I got to say, that since I said that thing that might not put him in the best light, I'm going to say something really nice about him is that he insisted on learning the game before he would sign up. And he didn't just do like a five minute demo. He played Magic all afternoon with admittedly a very attractive young lady um, who just taught him how to play Magic all afternoon. And um, he liked it. That's an interesting pivot we should pull out because we, we started this story about Pokemon and about uh, Magic, but Magic actually had a special set that was tailored towards, you know, sort of Chinese fantasy or specifically Three Kingdoms, uh, Portal Three Kingdoms. Yeah. So obviously that was designed to to sort of bridge that cultural gap. You're right. I uh, I started to to blend uh, uh, blend those stories together, but we had uh, uh, so the story started with us distributing magic into China, and then uh, but it was quick. You know, Pokemon ended up becoming part of the product mix and going in as well. And by the time we sold the company to Hasbro. Uh, we were selling more in China than Hasbro was. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll forgive you uh, for crossing those story threads because obviously there was a lot of drinking going on in those days. <laughs> um, uh, so you mentioned Hasbro there. Tell me, obviously, you know, Wizards is not ha not owned by Hasbro when Pokemon comes along. Tell me, uh, like, is it like how does that transition happen? Is the fact that you are distributing Pokemon cards essentially in a sort of Toys R Us sort of sense? Is that what had Hasbro come knock on the door? Hasbro, bro, uh, oddly enough, was not that interested in Pokemon, even though they ended up making a lot of money at it. Um, Hasbro is certainly opportunistic and recognizes the value of licenses and will go out and get good licenses. Um, you know, they were you know, a huge seller of Star Wars action figures, for example, uh, and so on and so forth. So they they liked um, uh, Pokemon, but at least Hasbro of 22 years ago, uh, when, uh, I don't know what it's like now. I want to make that caveat. Uh, was very much that they like to own brands and exploit their own brands, as opposed to uh, that was more strategically important than um, licensed brands. They also Hasbro also felt Hasbro was aware of this, you know, our, our tabletop gaming category, right? You know, role playing games and war games and the geeky board games and miniatures. I mean, it's not like Hasbro didn't know that existed. It was just too small to be interesting for a long time. And we proved that it could be good money. And so when you're a big corporation, you know, sometimes you get into a market by acquiring somebody in the market, preferably the market leader. And so <clears throat> Hasbro became interested in us more for Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. And one of my favorite moments was when Alan Hassenfeld, uh, who was the CEO at that time, um, one of the Hassenfeld brothers, i.e. Hasbro, uh, when Alan told me, he said, Peter, we would not have been interested in this company if it was just the magic company, because that's just one brand. But Dungeons and Dragons, you've got two leading brands in this category, and that means a lot to us. And so so that was, uh, and yeah, the Pokemon money, good money, great. Uh, but, you know, and I think the fact that Hasbro lost the license, you know, a couple of years after I left Hasbro um, kind of, you know, bespeaks to that uh, sort of like, now we, we really value our own brands more than licensed brands. Yeah, it's such a fascinating perspective because obviously, you know, from an outside observer, you would never expect that they, that's the big thing that drives a big toy company. You know, you see, obviously the Pokemon dollars come in and you see that sort of thing because uh, obviously that timing is is very very intertwined you know 1990 year 1999 much like 1997 was for wizards of the coast much like 1993 and 1994 was is a very significant year in that history because pokemon comes out you guys obviously get acquired by hasbro it's it's really fascinating to hear this firsthand and i really do appreciate the stories that you've shared today now um just obviously you know to sort of summarize there's a like i said i i literally wrote 88 
think 88 questions today and, and I had to pare it down to 37 and I've already skimmed over a few. But I, I did just want to know, this is a general thing because I would hate to go away without asking you, you know, what other, like, do you have any other proud moments about exploring this new genre, this collectible games world? Like, is there anything else that you can think of, you know, akin maybe to that China story or something like that, that, uh, you know, you as a as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, as, you know, just as a, a person, we're really, really proud of, you know, that especially stands out for crafting this hobby that so many people love? Well, um, we started to talk, we, we touched on the international aspects of especially Magic the Gathering. And D&D has always been a bit more American-centric, but um, uh, Magic really did well in a lot of international markets. And and that I love to travel. I, I'm progressive by nature. You know, yes, everybody is welcome at my gaming table. I don't care what ethnicity you are or what your orientations are. I want to game with everybody. And it's it's and so I, I love that magic was um was so successful in a lot of international markets. And I remember one story I remember that I really valued was uh the homelands <laughs> release. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, the one in New York City? Well, there was a release event in New York City, but the Homelands uh, release, uh, I went to Milan and I, in, in Italy, and I was I was in Italy um, along John Jordan, who was our head of international business, and we went to a, a magic event, which was a Homelands. It was, we weren't doing pre-releases, I don't think. We did pre-releases starting with Ice Age. I think that comes later, but it was a, it was a release event around, hey, here's the newest magic expansion. It's Homelands. And it was a, of course, it's, it's, it's a public event. There's all sorts of gamers there. And I, they put me out as they often did to, to play magic with people. And which I liked, I was, yeah, sure. I'm a geek. I'll sit out there and play magic and I'm playing magic with these kids who are Italian and they're young. They're like 12 and they don't know English. These, these kids did not know English. And of course I didn't know Italian, uh, but we're playing magic together, you know. I, there was just it was just this moment of like, this is a really cool international game because I could sit and, and have this connection with these young boys who we don't share a common language, but but magic is the language. Magic's the, the language, right? And so, uh, yeah, and the cards were in Italian, so they could read the cards. And uh, I had somebody who would. I, I had a list of the the cards, the English version, because they they anticipated this. They said, "Okay, here's a list of all the cards, and here's the translations, because you're going to be playing with Italian cards." And so, uh, that was a special moment. That's amazing. That's amazing to see this. This, you know, you know, obviously it's the gamers' dream. Like you said, you you wanted people at your table, anybody at your paid table, and now you're transcending language barriers through this very, this very, very sort of you know, a rudimentary game, you know, this this relatively simple game, especially as it was in that era. Now, uh, I, I'm going to wrap up. There's only a couple more questions left and then we'll get on to cracking questions, which is always fun. Um, uh, highlights. Obviously, over 30 years of hindsight, um, it, you approached the genre at such a young age. You approached your, uh, basically through a series of miracles and, and good fortune. Tell me, is there anything now that you have sort of taking a step back all these years later going, oh, I wish I had done this differently, especially in regards to sort of the release model or, or some choice that you, you know, you sort of made in those early days that you didn't see being a problem or didn't, you don't know, didn't anticipate being something that would be an issue or, or something that you perhaps regretted. Tell me about that. Yeah, you know, I don't regret anything having to do with the product itself. I felt like we acted with integrity and authenticity throughout the life cycle, made uh, the best decisions that we could at the time and, and generally did pretty well uh, with, with the product. Um, you know, what I regret, the things I look back at and, you know, are, uh, they're always the human issues, you know, like um, just awkwardness of, you know, doing layoffs when we're making money, you know, or doing, um, you know, we really bungled um, the original art agreements that we, you know, that we had with artists in terms of contracting artists to illustrate magic cards. And we signed a deal that was um, very lucrative for the artists, but also um, uh, really gave away rights that we needed as a company to be a, the licensor for magic. And so we had to go back to the artists and unwind that. And we didn't, you know, it wasn't, um, not everybody was happy with that. You know, it was uh, it's things like that. You know, th those are the things where, 
you look back and say, I, I wish I would have had a bit more um, patience with the organization in terms and, and a bit more insight in how um, I treated people. And, you know, so it's, it's something that I, I really try now to treat everybody with, you know, respect and fairness, love, you know, and um, it wasn't always that way. Yeah. Well, as somebody who's done business for over 30 years and in, in this gaming space and stuff like that, that is all about, you know, sharing and connecting with other people. I think, I think, you know, it, it, when you zoom out far enough, you did an amazing job, you know, like obviously, you know, there are a lot of business people who would not have acted in the way that you did or would have made the choices that you did or wouldn't have put the players first, as we discussed during the episode, you know, there is, uh, you know, obviously there's mistakes that get made and, and, and there's things that you could never have anticipated when you made those magic contracts with the artists. There was no way you thought you were going to be selling billions of cards within a year or, or whatever the number was. It's absolutely, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a forgivable sin if there is a sin there at all. Now, uh, let's zoom out from your work. We spent so long talking about your work. I have one last sort of question that uh, was sort of formulated. It came from a listener, but um, but I've sort of worked it into the main body of the interview here. Um, tell me, like, what was your favorite collectible game that was not made by Wizards of the Coast? Did you ever have something you came across, whether it was uh, obviously Cloud Doesn't Count or something like that, but like, uh, like a collectible card game from that sort of era? Tell me if, uh, if you have an answer. Yeah, that's easy. I always thought Legend of the Five Rings was an excellent game. And um, uh, I was happy that that stayed around for so long. I was happy for John when he's able to sell it, um, you know, and, and um, you know, I, I don't know if, if Fantasy Flight or Amazon Bay has kept it going. I have no idea. But um, uh, I thought that was um, a, a well-designed game. It's good. Absolutely. And it, it survived as a brand, you know, not just as a, a card game, but it obviously had life as an RPG and it's still, I believe that's, if there is anything still going, that's where it is at the moment. And it's, like I said, John was my first ever interview. So obviously I agree with that statement there. So uh, that's been fantastic. All right, well, let's wrap up with uh, the most traditional way we do on this show. That is Kraken Questions. Release the Kraken. <laughs> So uh, on this game, we just choose one of these three colored booster packs. It's got three silly questions and one silly que- uh, one serious question. I, I play blue, so I'm going to play blue. All right, blue it is. There you go. It's the color of wizards. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Think about it. That's right. Obviously, always the smartest. So as I said, three uh, common questions, one rare question. Let's see what we've got in the blue pack today. Uh, <laughs> if an animal could talk, which one do you think would be the rudest? Cats. Cats? <laughs> yeah, you're probably right about that. I mean, we are there to serve them. Yeah, absolutely. And they don't give a fuck. <clears throat> they, they're so happy that they finally domesticated us. Awesome. Awesome. Exactly. That's right. They take care of their every need. Exactly. I mean, we're changing their bathroom, right? <laughs> um, okay. So another common question. Your life is a movie. What's the genre? Oh, my life is a movie. What's the genre? Well, fantasy, of course. I mean, that's too obvious of an answer, I suppose. But, you know, I love fantasy. I, you know, I love the, I love the hero's journey. I mean, that, that sounds like I'm making myself out to be a hero. But I mean, it's like, I like, you know, the quest, you know, the quest. What's the journey? What's the quest? And what are the obstacles that fall along the way so fantasy and if nothing else we've talked about the ultimate gaming quest in today's interview you know we've gone from the gamut from you know 1990 all the way through to the end of uh hasbro years and stuff like that it's absolutely amazing journey that you sort of went on um and i think it's been a fantastic story um all right last common question who wins batman or dracula well the problem batman has is that he also goes out at night <laughs> It does seem like a problem if he was just willing to stay up a little bit uh, during the day. Yeah, I I think Batman just gets lucky a lot. I think that I I think Batman's going down. You think Batman's going to fall? Uh, that's that. I mean, I think I mm, I mean, I'm sure they've done a comic book about this that I've never read. But yeah, absolutely, Batman. I mean, maybe he gets a garlic spray though and just sort of trumps it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Figures it out. Well, if he knew he was fighting Dracula, okay. But if Dracula just showed up in Gotham City and tracked down Batman, I th- I think I don't think Batman's got a chance. Yeah, that bat grappling gun kind of looks like a cross. Maybe he could get improvised. Now, if Batman knew he's coming. Then, uh, then well, he just spent a lot of money and find all the right things to fight him. You know? I mean, vampires aren't that hard to kill if you know they're you know you're facing a vampire. And they got a lot of vulnerabilities. Exactly. A piece of wood. <laughs> 
Uh, and your last rare question. All right, it is uh, a little bit more of a metaphorical one. Uh, if you weren't in gaming, uh, but could be in any other career of your choosing, what would it be? Um, well, I was a I was a Boeing. I was a rocket scientist before I started Wizards of the Coast. I probably would have just stayed there in Boeing, and maybe I'd be uh, working on the uh, the latest rocket by now. I don't know. Yeah, I I I, I left Boeing. Because I wanted to be an entrepreneur and wanted to make games. It wasn't because I hated Boeing. I liked working at Boeing. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, we didn't really even touch it in the episode, but yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, you you made connections at Boeing, and that's where a lot of the sort of uh, tenets of your you know business started out. You know, like there was a lot of that early days stuff. And and the thing that I find amazing is, you know, maybe we shouldn't be. Uh, comparing uh you know everything to rocket scientists maybe we should be calling it uh game entrepreneurs you know it's not game entrepreneurship you know instead of it's not rocket science or game design you know i think there's, that's, that's where the real intellect is <laughs> absolutely well again thank you so much for joining me today uh peter it has been an absolute pleasure before we get out of here um tell me uh let's just figure out like i mean uh, I obviously love Gen Con and I love everything else that goes into that. And the reason I haven't actually told you this or shared this with you, but the reason I started this show was I was inspired by your show on Gen Con TV, Fireside. You know, I was like, what if I could have these conversations with other people? Oh, really? Thank you. I had no idea. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. And, you know, once you guys started doing it during the pandemic, I'm like, well, that looks you made it look so easy. <laughs> I was like, I can probably take this on board as well. So I love obviously Gen Con TV and everything you guys do there. But tell me about, you know, what are you up to lately? Like what else is going on in that world? Um, well, I um, you know, I acquired Gen Con back in 2002. I have, I have partners, but my partners and I have owned it ever since. And um, I don't actively do much at Gen Con other than I run the Gen Con Twitch channel, which is Gen Con TV. So <clears throat> part of doing that is I work with independent producers who come in and who, you know, like the ideal producer for me is somebody who has a great idea for a show, but they don't want the hassle of running a whole Twitch channel because to be a successful Twitch channel, you have to have a lot of programming. Well, what if you just want to do one program, right? And want to do it really well. And then Gen Con TV makes a lot of, a lot of sense. And so I've got, you know, like about eight or 10 shows that are on Gen Con TV. And one of the shows, I'm the producer, I'm producing a show called Actoroki. And the uh, actor Oki is, we call them turning RPGs into movies. And so what we do is it's uh, we on a, on a three episode cycle that repeats. Um, and uh, the first episode in the cycle is we stream a, a role playing game, tabletop role playing game, Dungeons and Dragons usually. And that, okay, that that's like a lot of other streams that are out there. But then what we do is a little bit more unique. We take and we hire actors to act out, to perform against the green screen the screenplay adaptation of the story created in a role-playing game. So it's different cast. The RPG players are one thing. This is our actors. And because we film in front of a green screen, we can swap out the green screen. We can key it out and put in fantasy art of where the characters are at. We can add props. We do costuming. Make it, you know, kind of good, you know. Uh, but we, we, we turn that into a movie in one more week. We edit it. And so... From the time of the RPG session until the movie night where we show the movie is two weeks. And then and then we start over again. And it's a crazy schedule. It's super intense. It's I've always liked um, in 2011, I went to film school. And so I've always had this sort of side gig of interest in filmmaking. And so this uh, brings together my love of role playing games and my love of filmmaking um and that's that's what's what we're doing it's really cool we're on wednesday nights at 6 6 p.m pacific time on twitch.tv slash gen con tv like share follow etc <laughs> you've got that down it's that like you're absolutely a professional in the world of streaming so uh what well, that's going to be all linked in the description i'm going to link some of the older episodes as well just so people can uh can uh catch up with it like i said uh, i'm also going to link those fireside episodes i just mentioned as well because if you're interested in the conversation we just had here we've just had a massive conversation with peter but if you want to hear peter have that conversation with a ton of his old colleagues and learn tons of sort of stuff about collectible trading card games the business side of things which is so rarely discussed you know there's always uh you know gameplay and design and stuff talked about uh i definitely recommend you guys check that out um i appreciate you guys joining us today again uh i'll be linked in the description and everything like that but before we get out of here i've got one more thing to say goodbye from me goodbye from you peter 
Goodbye. Thank you so much for doing your research. You had great questions, Rance. I really, really appreciate that. But you made that research so much, uh, very, very easy when it's something that I really want to learn about. All right, that's it from us. Thank you so much. And until next time, remember, keep shuffling. There you have it, at the 30th episode of our newly retitled Booster Pack show, now called Booster Pack Throwback. Thank you so much for joining us, and don't forget, we were also celebrating 30 years of collectible trading card games as we enter 2023. I am absolutely excited to see what comes out next year. There's so much exciting news, but I also can't wait to see what happens over the next 30 years of the genre as well. Now, before we get out of here, I want to say a big thank you for Peter for joining me. He is obviously one of the names that was very, very first on my mind when it came to creating this show. And I'm so glad to be able to realize this interview. I, and as we mentioned in there, if you're interested in anything that Peter has done uh, or mentioned in the episode, it's going to be all linked in the description or show notes. And especially I want to call out, as I did in the episode, what inspired me to make this show, because if you like this kind of content, you might like that as well. That is called Fireside with Peter Atkinson. You can find that over on the Gen Con TV channel. It has got a whole bunch of episodes. The first season is all about stories from Magic the Gathering, and the second season is all about stories from D&D. And there are some exclusive interviews with people that you won't find anywhere else online so again if you're into this sort of nitty-gritty history especially some of the business side things and some of the card crafting and all that sort of stuff there's some amazing stories in that that i recommend you go check out now as for me i have been rands and you can find me via social media if you have any feedback about this new episode format or anything else that you've seen on this show or any of the new changes that have come to the channel you can find me on facebook and twitter via at ccg history and you can also send me an email if you prefer. That email is linked again in the description or the show notes. Plus, if you don't really want to type anything up, feel free to find our listener survey, which is also going to be linked in the description. Now, the listener survey does just cover this show and it's not been updated for the network yet, but that'll come very, very soon, hopefully. But feel free to let me know anyhow what you found in there. And if you're listening to this at a later date, perhaps it has been updated. Now, the other thing I want to mention is if you're interested in classic collectible card games and building out a collection, don't forget to check out our sponsor, Category 1 Games. Also going to be linked in the description, especially if you're looking for the, some of those games that we talked about uh, at the beginning in the intro. Things like Vampire the Eternal Struggle, Battletech, Netrunner, all those other sort of classic collectible card games you don't hear a lot about nowadays. They have great competitive prices, good customer service on that sort of stuff. So go check them out. If you have any questions, they're always happy to email and uh, talk to you with you all about that sort of stuff. So I couldn't be happier to have them as a sponsor as well. All right, that's about it for me. Thank you so much for joining me once again. I hope we see plenty more of you and I would love to hear what you think, especially if you're a longtime listener to the channel and to this show, uh, what you think of all these new changes. So thanks so much. Again, remember, I've said it once and I've said it, will say it once again. Keep shuffling. <laughs>